Hi, I'm Nicole Carroll, Editor-in-Chief of USA Today, and I'm here with Susan Page, who just mm -hmm. an hour ago finished the first and only vice presidential debate of the election. Congratulations, Susan. You had a serious and substantial debate. How are you feeling? I, I feel great. I feel like it was um, such an honor to do this. I mean, it's such an American tradition to have debates and for, to have the candidates show up. And uh, sometimes they answer your questions and sometimes they don't. Um, but I'm, but I'm, I'm very, um, I'm very uh, gratified. Excellent. Well, you, you got a lot of good questions in and you did get some answers. <laughs> And it's interesting, you started with a statement of how things were going to go. You said it's going to be civil, you said you're not going to interrupt, um, and you really set them straight. Were you worried after the first presidential debate about how things were gonna go? Yes, um, I thought it was a problem in the first debate and that, uh, that the candidates, especially President Trump, didn't follow the rules that had been arranged beforehand, um, and it made a very unsatisfying experience for voters. I mean, that I, I tried to keep in mind that these debates are designed to help voters. They're not for the news media, they're not for the candidates, they're for the voters. And it struck me that that was not helpful to voters. So in the week since the first presidential debate, I tried to think about how can you have a different kind of conversation? And one way was to take a little bit of time at the beginning to say, here are the rules that you have agreed to and that I'm gonna to try to enforce. I thought that was a, a really a smart move on your part. But despite that, mm -hmm. both candidates pushed the limits, but particularly Vice President mm -hmm. Pence. Almost every question he kept going. At one point, I counted seven uh, thank you, Mr. <laughs> Vice President, during the climate change question. What was your strategy in dealing with that? Well, first of all, the candidates got two minutes uninterrupted to answer the original question that I posed to them. Uh, and when that time ran out, which they could see on their camera, they could see a yellow light at 30 seconds and a red light um, when their time was up. I, I took kind of to three to give them time to finish. And then I began to say, thank you, Mr. Vice President, or thank you, Senator Harris, um, thinking it would prompt them to stop. It didn't always prompt them to stop. So sometimes I said it over and over again. We didn't have a mic switch to cut off their mics. I would, don't know that that would have been a good idea um, in any case, but I, self I felt the only thing I could do was to interject that his time was up. Do you wish you'd had a mic switch? No, I don't think that's a, I don't, no, I don't. Um, but I, and also I think everything about a debate tells voters something. So with both candidates, um, and especially with Vice President uh, Pence, they didn't address the question that I asked. And um, that is uh, frustrating to me because I spend a lot of time writing those questions. Uh, but that is all illuminating in its own way to voters. And that was the point. It's, you know, it's not, it's not an interview. It's not a news conference. It's a debate. So the goal of a debate is different and your agenda in a debate is different. And whereas in a news conference or an interview, I would have followed up and said, you didn't answer my question. That was not, I thought, the appropriate thing to do in a debate. It, it's true, you, you, were, you were keeping things moving. Um, some of the feedback we're getting early on even though around the vice president because he so continually kept talking mm -hmm. is that it was disrespectful to you as a moderator and as a woman and there's questions about would he have treated a male moderator that mm -hmm. way what do you think about that uh, I don't I don't know the answer to that um, the of course he participated in the vice presidential debate uh, four years ago with a woman uh, moderator and he did similar things um, with that debate as well where he talked on and, and uh, talked over her. Um, so I don't know that I've seen him in that kind of setting with a male moderator. The first question is an important one. It sets the stage for the debate. And you started with coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And you started your first question with Senator Harris. So I'm curious, did coronavirus move up in your order because of the recent news? And how do you decide which candidate goes first? Uh, I didn't decide which candidate uh, goes first. The two campaigns met and decided which candidate mm -hmm. went first and they decided on, uh, on Senator Harris. Um, coronavirus was always going to be my first topic. Uh, 200,000 Americans dead uh, in the space um, of a year uh, and in a pandemic that is not yet under control, that, that is the topic, that is the most important topic facing the nation. And in fact, the two topics that followed related to the coronavirus. The second one was the role of the vice president uh, and the question of presidential disability, because that's been sharpened 
concern about that sharpened by President Trump's diagnosis with COVID-19. And the third topic on the economy, uh, the, the issue of the economy has been transformed by the coronavirus uh, and its economic impact. So in a way, the first half hour of the debate was focused on the coronavirus and its various repercussions. Uh, speaking of coronavirus, I'm curious how well you thought the commission did on safety. And just as an example, we're both wearing these green wristbands. <laughs> They're very attractive. Very attractive yeah. because everyone has been tested for coronavirus. We're sitting six feet apart. In the debate hall where we were sitting, they were people were spaced out. Everybody was wearing a mask. And before you came on the stage, one of the co-chairs came up and said, you will wear a mask. If you take it off, yeah. we're going to come back and ask you to put it back on. And if you refuse, your ticket is now canceled which was very, you know, very firm on the rules. How did it feel to you as a moderator? Well, they were very serious about uh, uh, taking the appropriate protective measures. Um, they, the deba debate commission worked with the Cleveland Clinic um, on, on protocols to make sure it was a safe space. Um, and, you know, they got some criticism in the first debate when the Trump family came in they had a mask requirement, but when the Trump family came in, they took off their masks um, and declined uh, being encouraged. When they were encouraged by someone from the Cleveland Clinic to put them back on, declined to do so. And then we had the president diagnosed with, uh, with COVID-19. So I think that got everyone's attention on the need to set the rules and really enforce them. So they enforced them in a pretty fierce way. I thought they did too. Um, when you brought up coronavirus, you tried to move on in the next mm -hmm. question to um, the, the president's age and the, you know, the role the vice president would, would play. Neither of them answered that question. In fact, Vice President Pence said, I want to go back to the vaccine. And you said, no, I want to move forward. And he says, no, I'm going to go back. <laughs> so I understand when they dodge a question. What does it feel like when they just, just don't listen? So, um, you know, I tried to think this through beforehand um, and about what the goal was and how you get to the goal. And um, I had to I had to hold, but I had to restrain my normal reporter instincts, which would have been to interrupt him during the two minutes when I said he wouldn't be interrupted and say, no, that's not the question I asked. And of course, on that question, the question of presidential disability, neither one of them answered the question. So I'm pretty sure neither one of them perhaps have had this discussion with their principal, which was the question I was asking. But that's illuminating for voters too. And we set these rules so that the candidates have a chance to speak, it's not my debate. Um, I don't, I, I, and it's it's their debate. It's the voters' debate. It's a different breed of cat than the kind of thing I usually do as a reporter. At one point, when you were talking about the military, they were both talking over each mm -hmm. other, and they weren't listening at all. And you you shut it down. You said, "Listen, these are the rules the campaigns agreed to. You're going to ab abide by them, and we're going to get back on track." And it worked. Were you holding that, that card <laughs> for a certain moment? And when did, why did you decide to play it then? So we, we had a mock debate. And the mock debaters were extremely rude to me and, uh, and interrupted me all the time and had fights and talked over each other. And um, by the, as we worked through the mock debate, I became more and more um, uh, aggressive in trying to shut it down because nothing else was working. And that was script, that was like exactly what I said in the mock debate. And in fact, in the mock debate, I even went like this, which was intended as a visual signal to them to pay attention, to be quiet. You can't talk at the same time. Um, fortunately, in this debate, I only had to do that once. In the mock debate, I had to do it like three times. I did see you do that to Vice President Pence one time when he was trying to interrupt. <clears throat> you just, you kept, I don't know if the camera caught it, but you kept doing that. Well, the one thing I was concerned about early on with Vice President Pence was that he was getting much, much more time to speak than uh, Senator Harris was. And I, on my desk, there were two clocks that showed me the cumulative time that they'd each spoken. And I was uh, concerned about making that equal. I wanted them to have roughly equal times to speak. And I was glad that at the end of the debate, according to my clocks, Senator Harris had 30 seconds more than Vice President Pence so that is that meets the standard of roughly equal times to speak. But early on, it was clear it required more aggressive moderation than I had planned to keep it about equal. You had nine segments, 10 minutes each, mm -hmm. and you got through them, correct? Did you get through all Not nine? exactly. I no? said I was going to have nine segments. We had eight segments. We didn't get through nine. Um, it became clear at about the one hour mark that we were running late. We'd run over on, on several of the segments. And I dropped uh, one of the topics, which was immigration. Mm. 
How did you come up with the questions? I mean, you had the whole world to choose from and you mm -hmm. had 90 minutes to do it. How did you winnow down your questions? So I wanted to keep voters in mind. Um, so I tried to ask about issues that voters care about. So there are issues that Washington journalists care about. Um, there are issues about uh, that congressional correspondents care about that are not necessarily issues that resonate with voters. So I tried to ask about questions that resonate in voters' lives. Um, and so coronavirus, you know, definitely the economy, uh, of, of course, racial justice, an important issue, the Supreme Court. That's what I tried to keep in mind in choosing the topics. And in drafting the questions, I tried to get questions that would get them to say, I tried to draft very narrow questions to try to get an answer. This was perhaps less successful than I'd hoped. <laughs> I loved your last question, and I thought it was the perfect ending to the debate. You really brought people together again. How did you come up with the idea of using that? Uh, it was an eighth grader's question mm -hmm. about um, civility, basically. Well, the the uh, University of Utah did a website for the debate, and they asked USA Today for a picture of me, and they put it up on their website. Uh, and so I went to look at it to see my picture, and I saw that the Utah Debate Commission, there was a thing there that said you can write an essay what would you like to ask? And it was it was a program for kids in school in Utah. And so I contacted the Utah Debate Commission and I said, you know, I'd like to see what kids write. And so they sent me, you know, a sheaf of um, essays. And so they, several of them were very interesting, but I thought the one from Breckland Brown was by far the best. That was a great way to end. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you so much for, for talking to us. This is the very first interview. Literally, we're an hour <laughs> past the debate, and you sat down with us, so we really appreciate that. Final question, talk about the goals going into this debate, and, and did, do you feel like you got there? Well, I, d I didn't get answers to all the questions I'd hoped to get. Um, I think they, sometimes I got prepared speeches instead of spontaneous responses. That shouldn't be a surprise. I hope that voters who watched it thought it helped them decide who has the policies they support, who has the leadership characteristics um, that they want to see. I hope it helped voters. That's, that's what I hope. And so you tell me if it was successful. I think that came across very much, that you were the moderator for the American people. And we really appreciate it. Oh, well, so thank, you. thank you, Susan Page. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.